Welcome, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me on the back? Um, this is the uh, uh, Rebooting Social Media Speaker Series. Every Wednesday, we're meeting here with uh, exciting talks regarding um, the uh, uh, harms and uh, potential approaches of mitigating the socio-technical uh, ecosystem or uh, mitigating the harms on the socio-technical ecosystem that we have. And today we have a very exciting panel. Uh, and uh, before introducing the panel, I'd love to introduce you the, the uh, moderator of the panel, which is Paulo Carvão. Paulo Carvão approached us with, with this idea of talking about uh, AI ethics in, uh, from an industry perspective, something that I think in the academic space is more and more needed. And I hope that you feel welcome to engage with this debate in a critical and uh, reflexive manner um, in part of the Q as part of the Q&A after our presentation. Uh, just to say that Paulo is a global uh, technology executive um, who led lar uh, large businesses at IBM, where he was a senior leadership team until uh, last year. Since then, he has acted as a strategic advisor for uh, technology and go-to-market issues and as a venture capital investment investor and investment committee member. During his social impact fellowship at the Harvard Advanced Leadership in Initiative, Harvard Ali, uh, Paulo will focus on the intersection of technology and democracy and on entrepreneurship as a vehicle for social mobility. I ask you to welcome Paulo, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Guzo, and uh, welcome everybody for our AI ethics and uh, governments panel. Uh, I'm excited to have two former Harvard alum here, so welcome back home. And uh, as we know, AI, artificial intelligence, is more and more part of our lives today, right? Either as individuals, citizens, uh, business leaders, academics, lawyers, researchers, it's part of uh, what we do. And uh, as with uh, any tool, it has a good side and could have a bad side. Uh, it has a tremendous potential. Uh, some say that it can add several, several trillion dollars uh, to the economy, economy through personal and also business productivity, but also uh, could have some negative impacts. So uh, I'm uh, glad that there's ample discussion now uh, within our society about uh, what are the safeguards that we have to have in place and whether uh, and how to uh, regulate uh, the technology and or its, uh, its use. Uh, there is a widening gap uh, between the leading edge of technology innovation and our ability to either set standards or drive regulation. And I think it's within this gap that uh, we want to have uh, this uh, discussion today. It's also important to have a normative point of view related to this on uh, how we value human creativity, human innovation, and uh, how we're going to protect it. So this week, uh, needless to say, has been an extremely busy week in this area. We started at, I think it was 8 a.m. on Monday with the, the White House issuing an executive order, a pretty comprehensive executive order in this space. And today and tomorrow uh, in the UK, we're having the UK safety, AI safety uh, summit. So I'm uh, thankful for both governments to have adjusted their calendars to meet our agenda here. And uh, but uh, as Guzo mentioned in the beginning, I, uh, I felt that it was very important for us also to have an industry perspective to this topic, because ultimately the industry uh, are the ones who are developing and uh, deploying uh, either directly or through uh, their clients uh, this type of uh, technology. Full disclosure, as Guzo said, I've been part uh, of IBM for many years until I graduated uh, last year. So I'm looking forward to having a, a discussion with uh, uh, Christina and John. So just to introduce them a little bit, uh, Christina Montgomery, she is the Chief Privacy and Trust Officer at IBM. Uh, in that capacity, she oversees uh, IBM's privacy program and directs 
all aspects of uh, IBM's privacy policies. She also chairs the IBM AI Ethics uh, Board, uh, but outside of the company and in the industry, she is a global leader in AI ethics and governance, a member of the US Chamber of Commerce AI Commission, a member of the United States National AI Advisory Committee, which has been established last year to advise the president and the National AI Initiative Office. She's an advisory board member of the Future of Privacy Forum, advisory council member of the Center of Information Policy Leadership, and a member of the AI Governance Advisory Board of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Uh, and as I mentioned, a Harvard Law School uh, graduate. Uh, John, uh, John Fisk is the director of data protection at Meta, Meta uh, where he focuses on issues around privacy, including fairness and accountability, managing some of the most pressing privacy, data protection, and AI safety challenges in the world today. Before Meta, John served as a vice president at SAP and uh, was also a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, most of our Ramani Center for Business and Government, where he explored the implications of identity assurance, assurance uh, and safeguards against uh, AI online harms. So I think they bring uh, complementary perspectives. Uh, IBM, uh, it's uh, an iconic company from a B2B uh, perspective. Uh, Meta, Facebook, and all of their properties operate very strongly in the B2C space. I don't want to pigeonhole uh, companies to these spaces. I know IBM touches a lot of consumers in a B2B2C basis, and Meta also has a very significant, a very large B2B business, but I think uh, we can uh, you know, uh, have different, slightly different perspectives. So what we plan to do is uh, we'll have approximately 15 minutes of prepared remarks from each one of them. And then sh this should give us, you know, ample time for a dialogue here in the room and also with uh, those of you in the webcast. So let Christina, let's start. Sure, can you hear me okay? All right, 15 minutes is a long time. So if you have any, any questions along the way, feel free to interrupt. I thought it might help by just giving you a little perspective on IBM and what we do, because I find that um, since, you know, we used to have a PC business, we were in front of everybody with respect to, you know, on a daily basis from a brand perspective, but we haven't had a B2C business in a while. So um, we are, are often, you know, not familiar to a lot of people, but uh, critically, IBM, I think of us as sort of the backbone of the economy in many respects. We are supporting the critical infrastructure of some of the nations uh, and the world's largest banks, telecommunications companies, airlines, healthcare and hospitals, governments. We have about 4,000 government and uh, enterprise clients around the globe. We operate in 175,000 I mean, 175 countries, we have about 250,000 employees. So we're a big company um, and responsible, as I said, for supporting a lot of the critical information technology needs of some of the most critical and important industries in the world. Um, so it's really important to us as a result of that because we're managing such sensitive data and involved in su supporting such critical information flows and the like that trust be the foundation for everything that we do. So um, we started thinking about and going back from a privacy perspective, you know, we've had a chief privacy officer in IBM for almost a quarter of a century. Uh, I think I'm the fourth chief privacy officer in, in IBM's history. Uh, and then about, it's five years now that we established principles around AI that AI should augment, not replace human intelligence, that it should be transparent and explainable, and we've built out pillars around that, that it be fair, robust, privacy preserving as well. Um, and that importantly for us, because our business model is very different um, from a lot of the other platform companies and the like, that the data, uh, our data belongs to our clients. Um, so we don't have, you know, a platform approach. We very much are helping our enterprise customers be creators of AI solutions and technology. Sorry. 
Um, so we had these principles we established about five years ago, but we knew as a company that we needed a mechanism by which to hold ourselves accountable, like to measure and ensure that we were actually not only articulating those principles, but that we were building them into our practices. And importantly, we also advocate for policy. And so I spent a lot of my time in the policy space advocating for policy that's consistent with those principles. Um, some of the early things we did in the space after adopting the principles, establishing an AI ethics board, and our board, by the way, is very cross-disciplinary in nature. So it has representation from across the IBM business. Every business unit has a representative. So um, whether it be users of AI solutions, like in the HR space or CIO space, um, the policy teams, the legal teams, the sales teams, we have a very uh, large and at scale consulting practice, about 100,000 consultants within IBM. So they're represented to give us consumer perspective. Research, obviously, is my co-chair of the board, is a global AI ethicist, our AI leader. Um, from an ethics perspective. Um, so it's very cross-disciplinary in nature. We established that. We have a project office that supports the board that sits in the chief privacy office team. So we're sort of the facilitator and the enabler uh, and building out the governance program, the education program, all of that around, you know, building these principles into practice. But some of the early things that we did, so this is now four years that we've had this very operationalized. Um, we helped to create and sign the Rome call for AI ethics in 2020, which is looking importantly at what do we want to use AI for, right, as a society, like what role will humans play? Um, so big questions around AI. Uh, and also we established with the University of Notre Dame, the Technology Ethics Lab, also in 2020, that is focused purely on socio-technical aspects of AI. So. Um, practical, business oriented, but also research. So right now there's a very nice program related to AI auditing. So how do you study that? What does it mean? How do you standardize it? So just thinking about these issues that maybe in um, pure AI research labs hadn't been the focus of the research and attention. So that's where we've been sort of paying a lot of our attention. Um, from I talked about our principles, practices, and advocacy sort of approach to building out compliance with the principles. Uh, we also, it's been almost four years now that we put out a call for regulation of AI. Um, we called it precision regulation, uh, suggesting and recommending to policymakers that they regulate the use of AI because the context is so critically important, not the technology itself. You'll never be able to keep up if you start regulating technology and also the harms that we see play out in the AI ecosystem and its use and the like are very context based. So 2020, uh, we put that out um, and we've been following along the way the EU AI Act, which is the first, you know, that draft has been kicking around now for almost three years since 2021. Um, we came out immediately supportive of it because of the risk based approach. And because a lot of the things that it's calling for, for high risk AI uses are very much the way we were thinking about it from an IBM perspective as well. That those higher risk uses of AI, you know, you should make sure you're using quality data, that you have a risk management system, that you're transparent in the use of AI and the like. Um, so we've been following that debate and thinking about from the perspective of what will our clients need in order to comply with this regulation? Because again, we're an enterprise that is providing tools to our clients to create their own AI. We have our own foundation model, so I'll bring us now to where we are in the Gen AI debate, like what has happened in the last year. Um, because you don't often hear IBM in the conversations with the frontier model creators, you know, the, the chat GPT, open AI kinds of conversations. Um, so one of the first things we did, so, so again, I said we've been at this for a really long time, we've been advocating, we've been sort of pushing for um, a regulatory approach that's very use case based, not a lot of traction around the world um, until last year, right? And now, because it was pretty much the EU, you had a lot of conversations happening around the globe, but none very um, 
getting a lot of traction really, except in the EU that legislation kept progressing through and then you see chat GPT, all of a sudden the world wakes up, right? So uh, what have we been doing? I mean, since generative AI, we felt the first thing we should do, it's really important for the world to understand what are the new incremental risks and what is really the same? So one of the early things that the board put out uh, at IBM is this risks of, you know, risks and mitigation opportunities for generative AI. Focus on the fact that a lot of this is the same things we've been talking about. Transparency, explainability, it shouldn't be a black box, et cetera. But uniquely, generative AI could amplify some risks, right? It could scale a lot more quickly if you can have a large language model that's capable of drafting phishing emails and sending them out around the world with you know misinformation and the like relatively very rapidly in the hands of you know millions of people um, so it could be misused a lot more readily it's created new areas of focus for us around ip and copyright because you're now generating new content hallucinations those types of things but a lot of it's again coming back to those same basic practices around understanding what you're using AI for, understanding the data that's going into it, um, and having transparency around that data, having explainability. So we very early on, from a technology perspective, deployed things like AI fact sheets, which provide sort of an ingredient list for an AI model, um, what data was used to train it, what were the techniques used in order to like sort of uh, curate that data, you know, essentially, what does the person who's the next phase, right, who's taking that to the next stage and training it on their own data, our clients, what do they need to know about what they're starting with? Um, and how did they create their own fact sheet? So what we've done in the in the um, in the space of uh, generative AI is we are taking what I think is a unique platform approach for our clients. So we are deploying what we call Watson X which is a platform that has an AI studio for training AI models, a common data architecture to leverage the data to train models, and then um, a governance platform that it will enable lifecycle management. So we've taken a lot of the work we've done, and this is one of the great things about being a privacy team within a technology company, is a lot of the learnings that we have uh, you know, and the workflows we've built and the thinking we've developed, ethics by design approaches and the like in our AI ethics board process has helped inform that governance platform, the workflows, the data capture, all of that. So that when a client, they can start from either our own foundation models or third party models, including llamas in uh, our, our uh, studio or AI studio, they can pull from Hugging Face. There's a lot of open source models in there. Um, and then take, you know, that starting point and train their own AI based on that with their own data that remains their data. And then really importantly, have this governance capability that enables them to generate fact sheets, to um, have an auditable workflow, to do things that they will be required to do if they're not already required to do. Ultimately, they'll be required to do by regulation, particularly if they're using AI in a high risk context. So that's been our focus, this very holistic approach. We also reiterated a regulatory point of view recently. Not a lot to change there. You know, it is the same thing we've been calling for for four years, regulate the use, not the technology itself. Hold creators and deployers of AI accountable. So importantly, and, and we'll talk to John maybe a little bit about this, like we've said, like let's not repeat um, section 230 with broad immunity. You know, we need to be, re we need to be thinking about at this stage, while we have the time to do it, how do we hold creators and deployers of AI accountable for the technology they're implementing? And then where we're very much aligned with like a meta of the world and, and lots of others in the academic settings and the like is this open innovation approach. Like we are very concerned about um, an environment happening today where we're hearing calls for licensing of AI models, the sort of regulatory capture that we see happening, not just around the models themselves, but potentially around the data that's going in to train the models. If that starts to get um, locked up in a closed ecosystem, we're not gonna you know, benefit from what we firmly believe is a very open, innovative approach. You know, We acquired um, Red Hat 
uh, which is one of the most, um, you know, well-known companies in the open source world. We acquired them uh, six years ago, maybe at this point in time. Um, so they're a part of IBM's portfolio. <clears throat> yeah, so when I think about high risk, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the EU AI Act, but it's that's defined on as safety, uh, health, and human rights, like uses that could impact whether somebody gets access to public benefits, to housing, to a loan, um, health care, uh, safety applications that are impacting like autonomous driving, those types of things, um, we would consider high risk. Uh, and there are some areas in the EUAI Act, which you may or may not be familiar with, that are, that are uh, off limits. Like the, the EUAI Act says, there's a classification of high risk and there are things like I mentioned and across education and that type of thing as well. But then also off limits like social scoring um, mechanisms like uh, live facial recognition outside of and that's still being debated, those types of things. Um, so anyway, that's our latest POV. Uh, we have been very focused on driving international alignment. That is so important right now. And there are multiple efforts. I mean, Paul, Paul mentioned a bunch of them earlier that are happening just this week around the executive order, the uh, safety protocols for frontier models that a lot of the companies, including Meta, including IBM, committed to in the US. The G7 came out with their own set of safety models. Canada has a code of conduct. Um, I keep pointing back as good practices to things like NIST's risk management framework um, and hoping that we see more traction in getting that deployed as a standard around the world. That's great thinking on the part of the U.S. public-private partnership and collaboration about how you think about risk when you're developing, deploying, managing models. Um, so uh, as much international alignment as possible, I think will help support innovation while addressing risk. So we're very big proponents of that. Um, and then just in general, you know, we're very focused and I individually am very focused on the fact that AI, this is a moment where everybody's got, is paying so much attention to it. And there's this often rush to jump in and provide some kind of assurances because like everyone's touching it with chat GPT. Um, I was shocked with respect to how much attention even like my family, my parents, my grandparents like, are paying to this technology that they never even knew about before. Never, nobody knew what I did um, until this year, right? So, and I think a lot of politicians are hearing from their constituents that they're afraid of scams. They're afraid of all this stuff. There's very much a danger to regulate for a moment of fear that is going to be a problem. And all these conversations, and I know a lot of you may disagree with me, but around the existential you know, threats to humanity, I think are kind of distracting from what I'm trying to focus on right now. And I think what IBM is trying to focus on right now, which is the real practical, let's take care of the fact that we have to improve AI literacy. We have to uh, address the risks that are playing out in real world uses of AI today. And if we start imparting some best practices, we need national privacy legislation in the US, for example. We need some rules around uh, explainability and transparency and data and what it can be used for and what it can't be used for. We need to be focusing on those today. Um, another reason I'm here this week is that IEPP AI uh, Governance Conference, that's the International Association of, Private Pro uh, of Privacy Professionals, training now, I think, over 2,000 people in a field of AI governance that is needed. You know, people need to understand what the implications of these technologies are and how they can build AI systems while mitigating those risks. This is touching every industry, every profession, uh, everything you're learning, the way we deliver education, um, all of it. So we can't just be taking this, you know, approach, well, let's have a, an international regulatory body and then we'll lock down it. And, and the only people that could develop it are a handful of companies. I mean, that's not going to help us. This is a society that this is a long term um, marathon, not a sprint. And we have to think about it in that context. So that's where I'm spending a lot of my time. And I probably used 15 minutes, so I will turn it to John. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And I promised the audience on the WebEx that uh, or 
on the webcast that will repeat the questions and we'll have a roving mic here in the room also so that everybody else in the webcast can uh, can participate and uh, so fantastic uh, john welcome back to harvard i know that uh, you've been a fellow here at the kennedy school where we met but also you came here for college right so uh, welcome back and uh, we were chatting about uh, when we talk about all of these risks uh, in a sense, you're a line of defense, right, to uh, at Meta. So tell us a little bit more about that. And uh... That's all right. Thank you. And let me just give a shout out to the Sanskrit and Indian Studies Department at the Harvard College. Uh, <laughs> I'm a proud, proud grad. But anyway, um, yeah, I thought I'd share some reflections on basically, uh, unlike Christina, I was talking pretty umbrella about AI across all these industries. My, my focus, of course, is, is the online online harms. I'm focused to talk about uh, some of the risks and how we think about risk in that space as, as AI is, is developing. Um, so yeah, by way of introduction, four years, four years at Meta now in the office of the data protection officer. That's uh, the DPO is a function that uh, serve, basically oversees our compliance with European regulations, GDPR, DSA, DMA, AI Act, et cetera. So uh, kind of down in the weeds on the, on the European um, uh, compliance needs. Um, AI has always been a, an important part of our, of our oversight responsibility. Uh, Meta has 2025 large models deployed uh, for the past decade or so, basically to run everything, to personalize all the services, to manage safety and integrity, things like that. So these, uh, like Christina, it's sort of like suddenly this, the chat GPT has brought this to the front of everybody's consciousness, but these issues have been around for a while. Uh, first, a general caveat. I, unfortunately, I am not able to represent Meta here in any way, so these are just my own personal views expressed. I've also been told not to share much or anything about our internal practices, uh, so forgive me if I have to deflect any hard questions uh, later on. Um, so, but to give you a little sense of where I'm coming from and how, how we think about it uh, operationally, uh, <laughs> that last comment notwithstanding, <clears throat> my, my, team, my team is... Um, you could think of as a third line of defense in this in the compliance model. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the, the first line uh, are the teams, the, the product management, the engineering, product council, policy teams who work together to bring a new product to launch, right? And they're ultimately the most accountable for the safety of a product, or especially we'll talk about AI products in this, in this uh, example. Um, so that's the first line. Second line is uh, basically oversees the first line. There are governance function generally where they will make sure that all the right tests have been conducted, that the safety tests pass certain thresholds depending on the risks of the use case, et cetera, um, that all the documentation is up to date, like system cards, like Christina mentioned, we, we have the same, same idea, uh, trying to be fully transparent with um, what goes in and what comes out of the model to the best we can. So then my team and my role is sort of as a third line of defense, as, uh, as Paolo mentioned. Um, we, we monitor the first two lines, um, and by monitoring, we do either sort of metric-driven monitoring of how is the process working and how are the, the things performing, or we'll do deep dive kind of audit work where we go in uh, and explore certain topics of interest to us and, and then come back to the business with, with recommendations. Um, so that's monitoring. And then more and more, we're finding my, my personal attention, it's sort of like Christina's, is, is, uh, is shifting away from monitoring and more think about risk. Um, and I mean, you could, it's pretty obvious to folks, I think, but risk is at the heart of both governance and ethics, um, right? We can't govern things if we're not clear about what we're trying to prevent, what outcome we don't want to achieve. Uh, similarly with ethics, we can kind of think of that as balancing benefits and risks uh, for an individual or, or different groups of individuals and stakeholders. And how do we make sure that the balance of, of risk and benefit is fair? So, I mean, that's a bit simplistic, but that's kind of how, how I think about it. But, the point is risk is, is central to both ethics and, and governance. Um, and so, you know, and I'm gonna go, um, you know, within Meta, we have a very different taxonomy, but for this talk, I, I, I'd sort of pose that there are three buckets of risk that we could think about uh, with different governance requirements, societal governments, uh, governance requirements for each. So the first, is, first bucket might be the, the, the risk that the model or the product doesn't work as it was intended to do. Right, um, those and the risks there are pretty well known at this point. Things like bias, toxicity, hallucinations, or you know that the, the process that the bot or whatever will not act, uh, try, conduct the transaction accurately, or you know the, the privacy issues that that um, can come about if the training data is 
uh, inappropriate or or the or the operation um, is, isn't managed well. So these are things that are understood. It's when the model doesn't work as performed. Um, and accountability is crystal clear. It's on whoever's developing the the model. They they have to get that right. Um, and so. From my perspective, that makes that the, the most controlled bucket of risk. Like the risks are clear and the accountability is clear. We don't have solutions for a lot of these problems yet, but there are a lot of smart people working on it, doing the best they can. So I'm personally pretty confident within a few years, all the big problems we all talk about today will be will be yesterday's news, uh, and there'll be a new set of things. Um, so second bucket of risks. Uh, again, I'm thinking sort of holistically from an online harms perspective. Second bucket of risk is the um, the types of risk when the models may be working, the tools may be working as designed, as intended, but uh, being misused by bad actors. Um, and that, you know, I, maybe I, I personally may be staring into the abyss of online harms too much, but I, I see that as a more and more pressing risk. It's things we know about uh, the misinformation, you know, the amplification, the acceleration of it, um, with deep fake type technology, all the all the sort of the shaming, the blackmail, the fraud, uh, all, the, all the misuses you could think of around that. Um, we have societal harms around face rec that we're, we're plugged into. Um, and gen general and security breaches are getting more and more clever using all these new sort of AI powered attack vectors. So there's a whole bunch of risk that's coming sort of an, from an outside in perspective. It's not the companies that are generating the models, it's just the misuse of these models and tools that, uh, that I have to worry about. And to go a bit off into a tangent, I, I personally think in within a few years, we're going to need to have a kind of a rethink about online safety at a fundamental level where, I, I mean, again, I would, Paolo, you mentioned like I, I spent a year thinking about identity assurance, but I think that's a, a cornerstone of online safety in the near future. You have to do that in a privacy protective way, but we need ways to know, you, you kind of have to move to a zero trust environment where you're assuming that every entity and interaction is with a malicious bot at some point, unless proven otherwise. So we need to figure out how do we how do we make that how do we make that easy, practical for people to validate certain things about themselves and, and also to validate the, uh, the integrity of content. So I, I anyway, this is a long question. It sounds like Christina, you're pondering the same things. Um, but it's 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 uh, sort of the, the, the pressing pressing issue of, of the next few years, I think. And then the third bucket um, is sort of these longer term I don't think of them even as risks, but maybe societal changes that are coming from AI. Like you mentioned the same same point. Um, I think like basically when you picture a emotionally intelligent bot with you know fully human interactive capabilities, verbal, visual, etc. People will fall in love with things like this, uh, literally, and uh, maybe at the detriment of human relationships, or a super super um, capable digital assistant who could just take care of everything in your life from your insurance claims to your taxes to your um, social calendar i mean you you could be see becoming quite dependent on that uh plus information uh flows managing their your information flows your medical advice sort of creating highly personalized like we all live in sort of personalized bubbles online today already it could get much much deeper and more profound and again the social impact of that is a uh, big question mark uh something i worry about so Anyway, I, I, you get the point. The third bucket is kind of this future-facing, um, call it risk, if you will, but it's the things I hope entities like the Berkman Klein Center will uh, give us guidance on, because we are building tools now that begin to sort of drift in that direction. So the sooner we can get some safe guides, safeguards or guidance, like societal guidance on what, you know, what's appropriate, what's not, how do we, how do we even think about these changes, um, the better. So that's, that's my personal commentary. I'll leave it there and uh, open it up. Thank you, John. And I, I, I think a topic like this that's so open to uh, you know questions and different points of view, it's a, a moderator's dream because I don't need to think about questions. I've already have got a few coming online, but let's check first here in the room if, uh, if we have any questions. And uh, before asking, just wait for the mic to get to you. So we've got one back there, uh, the woman in red. Thank you for these comments, really interesting. Um, to bring in something I, I didn't hear discussed, I'm curious whether you have thoughts on um, 
whether proof of personhood types of systems, uh, privacy preserving, hopefully proof of personhood, uh, platforms and products would be one solution where we can say, let the bots run amok, let a thousand flowers bloom. But when you really want to know you're interacting with a human, we can do that. And it just won't be the existing platforms or they can have a specialized product. Would that solve all the AI challenges? Take this one, John. Yeah. Oh yeah, I love your opinion. I, I don't think it'll solve all the problems, but I, I do believe it's a cornerstone uh, that we're gonna need to think about setting pretty soon. Um, and there are some very good uh, privacy protective solutions coming out. Self-sovereign identity, if you're familiar with that, or um, some of the ISO standards that are emerging, basically allow people to keep control of their identity information and sort of selectively disclose just the relevant pieces in a trusted, secure manner. So uh, confirmed by a third party. So it's there are there are some models out there that are looking like they could be scaled. Um, I again, from a platform perspective, it becomes a whole lot easier if you to manage online harms if you can confirm who people are. As we all know, people pop up in a hundred different uh, identities and it may be the same person or, or fake people um, passing along information. So I think um, from a platform perspective, that's, that's gonna be an integral piece. I also think as bots come online and become more and more autonomous, we're gonna need to have accountability of bots and they should be identified by who they're serving explicitly. Um, and you, also with all the youth harms and youth concerns right now, you know, the parent-child relationships might be validated as well uh, through these through these uh, sort of uh, identity platforms, identity insurance. So I personally think that's, to my mind, it's sort of inevitable that we, ha if you really want a safe internet, that's kind of where we need to go. That's my personal view. I, I, I'm certainly uh, speaking blasphemy to many people, but uh, that, that's my view. So what do you think, Christina? <laughs> No, I wouldn't, I would, I would agree with that. Um, and I think just when, even today, when you think about how we've been looking at technology in IBM, like we've been clear because we have technology that our clients ask us to build that is, you know, very realistic chatbot technology, um, that type of thing. And we've had rules in place that require transparency. We don't want things to look too superhuman. Like, and, and, and so that's how we've been from our own perspective, trying to support what our clients want while also adhering to our principles, like making disclaimers and those types of things. But this whole idea of self-sovereign identity and what the web 3.0 or 4.0 is going to be, um, we had a lot of these discussions thinking back to COVID for technology solutions. They seem to have gotten quiet now because of all the focus on AI, but they have to come together at some point. And there is a definite um, sort of conflict in a sense between preserving privacy, but also having the solutions to help you preserve privacy and control your data, uh, like single ID and that type of thing that we haven't gotten, you know, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done on figuring out where we want to be as a society and then figuring out how you bring the technology along. I'm going to take uh, maybe one or two of the questions here online and uh, then I'll come back to the group. Uh, this is a kind of a hopefully an easy one. We talked about the importance of education and, and digital literacy in general. So I'm paraphrasing one of uh, Joyce's questions here, which is, uh, you know, how, given that this topic has some technical edge to it, uh, what are the resources that you would recommend for people to get to learn more about it? I know IBM recently launched an AI Academy, and, uh, but uh, so if you want to just, you know, talk a little bit about that and what recommendation would you have for people to kind of learn more about this, this subject? I'm sure John has some great ones, but yeah, the plug for the AI Academy, so that's available to anybody. Um, I think the first module released today, maybe, or very recently. So just good basic AI literacy um, is so critically important. I think you see in the executive order efforts from a White House perspective to improve AI literacy across government, across education. A lot of the directives in that order will, you know, play out by the agencies um, over the next couple of months, depending on the time frame they've been tasked to do that. But yeah, basic basic AI literacy is so critically important right now. And we're trying to do our part in scaling as a company. I think a lot of the tech companies are. I would point to those resources like the AI Academy. 
our public websites, even our if, if you want to learn about AI ethics, um, we deploy a lot of things in on our public website. We try to be as transparent as possible in terms of how we're thinking about issues and the like. Education is a big piece of our mission in IBM and in particular in my team. Um, yeah, I guess I would just answer that with it, beyond what Christina just said. Uh, first of all, technically, there's a, a, a slew of great YouTube videos. <laughs> that's, where, that's where I learn stuff um, about how the models work, if you're interested in that. Um, and for AI governance as a topic, I actually found the NIST model, which you referred to as very accessible, very clear, very clean. I, so I, I read that, it's 30, 40 pages, gives you a really good sense of how large organizations should manage AI. So I thought that was a great resource too. Let's uh, go back to the room here. Uh, I think we have one in the middle here, or you have the mic there in the back. Yeah, let's start with the back. I'm from biology department. I'm from biology department. During President Reagan's administration, there was a ban about creating life within the laboratory and because there was stiff opposition from the religious leaders then. And since then, times have passed, changed. Do you anticipate any kind of objections, uh, limitations, or opposition from the religious leaders, as well as the government? It depends upon which party is in power for this full-pledged AI system in the future. So I mentioned the Rome call for AI ethics. Um, that call in January of this year was republished with signatories from the three Abrahamic religions um, in a ceremony, which basically said, I mean, it's important because it basically said that, you know, they're committing and companies who signed on to it, including IBM, including Microsoft, um, I don't remember which the other ones were, but they'll, they'll commit to use AI to protect people and improve the planet. Like those were the fundamental principles. So there's some things you're not going to do and there's some things you are going to do, but it's having that set of sort of ethical rules um, that religions agreed on. That being said, you're never going to have a full global stand, right? I mean, because different parts of the world have different values-based system. So there's always going to be disagreement. If you look at something like social scoring, the EU is outlawing the use of AI and social scoring. In China, that's a big part of the AI solutions. It's just fundamentally different approaches to what we're going to use technology for. But there is some alignment. I would encourage you to sort of read the Rome call. Um, I do think it has really, so, so sort of really nice grounding across three of the um, major faiths. Of course, not all, but three of the major faiths. Yeah. You want to comment on this one? Because there's so many questions here online. But I'll just say, if, if your comment was about when does AI cross the line into becoming a lie, a, a life form of its own, and is that permitted or not? I, that's anyway. That, that that's an interesting philosophical question, but uh, I, I don't have any guy, I, I, understanding of the the religious uh, boundaries on that. But it, it's an interesting idea. The uh, there is a, this is from uh, Genevieve here online. A, a key issue with AI ethics in, in the industry is the tension between ethics, which requires a slowdown, doing extra checks, etc., and speed to market. How uh, do your organizations kind of balance this tension? And I think this is a core to what we're trying to discuss today, right? Here. Do you want to go or should I? Um, I mean, it, it's it's definitely a tension. Uh, so. But I, you know, all I can say is there's a lot of oversight, and people are pretty careful about weighing the risks of inaction versus the risks of action. And you know, um, we're, we're fairly thoughtful of weigh, you know, weigh, weighing all the outcomes. We look at vulnerable populations and how they might be impacted by by unintended um, uh, out, out, um, outcomes. So I, there's always a tension, but I. I and I know, by the way, I, I, part of our philosophy at Meta is, is uh, to embrace the open source uh, community, like Christina mentioned. Um, and the spirit of that is, too, that we know that these models aren't perfect yet. Um, and we, <laughs> because the risks are not yet so high, this is still a safe, pretty, we are, in our view, a safe uh, thing to do to kind of release them to the open source community, let people kick the tires and play with it and poke at it and see if they can uh, see what they can do. And that's the way we're all learning together. Um, 
it's sort of, sort of an iterative cycle that way. Um, I, I can't, I don't say there's a, I can't really answer the question any other way, but to say there's a, there's a lot of oversight and governance. We test, we use all the, all the tests uh, that, that, that are sort of mainstream at this point for bias, toxicity, safety, et cetera. But Christina, love your thoughts. Uh, so I think a lot of it comes down to having that governance process in place in your companies and following it. Um, and that's why the NIST is a great resource. Our, the process we talked about with our AI ethics board, um, and there's a whole sort of governance process around that, um, that we follow. We put our foundation models through it, you know? And so I think that helps to at least ensure you're vetting the issues. Um, and signing off at the right levels with respect to how much risk you're going to take. Uh, so I think one of the, for, I always tell companies that are thinking about like, how do I get started with AI ethics is to immediately, the first thing you need to do is just put a, pro, a risk management process in place, put a governance process in place. The temperature, turning that up or turning it down can change and it changes for crises it changed for covid like you know there may be technologies you would never have thought about potentially during a global pandemic that you want to bring to market that you know you turn the temperature up a little bit on risk to address you know it's a balance but if you have the process in place you've got the right starting point let's come back to the room i think uh, there was one there at the middle actually there are three so why uh, Guzo, let's try and take maybe two or three at the time so just since we go. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Craig. I'm a professor at USC Annenberg. And is, can you hear me? OK. And a uh, visiting scholar here at the Institute for Rebooting Social Media. My, dis, my interest is around AI and the creator economy. Meta has launched a whole suite of services and helped facilitate what Goldman Sachs will be says is a $1 trillion economy built off of social media platforms that will be deeply affected by these technologies. I wonder what sort of protections are in place for creators alongside all of these incredible suites of tools that have already been launched by Meta for all these creators to harness, including the possibility that, that Meta and other platforms may train their models off of creator content and launch their own competing creators um, and that will deprive these entrepreneurs of their livelihoods very valid question uh, i i will have to deflect as i'm a not an expert in this area and b i'm uh told not to opine on things internal but obviously the the copyrights are very important and the the rights of the creators are critical that we depend on them as well um as we sort of envision this this metaverse uh economy emerging so we definitely need to make it win-win for everybody i I'm afraid I'm, I'm really not expert in how we're handling this exact question, though. There, there was an interesting discussion earlier this week at the Rappaport Forum here at the law school, and I trust that this must be online somewhere, uh, which was still some debate even uh, within the you know, legal scholars in terms of how to handle copyright and IP, right? And, and, and by the way, do this in the absence, absence of privacy laws also in the US. So it's another one of those kind of fascinating topics in which there's some normative judgment that we need to apply. And then uh, we're in the process of uh, creating and inventing uh, regulation and legal jurisprudence also about this, right? So. Yeah, and I would just point you to a number of companies and organizations, including IBM, just submitted comments to the Copyright Office. They asked for, um, you know, input into how copyright law should change. So those should all be on file because I think they were due Monday. You should be able to read and see how companies are thinking about it. Hi everyone, my name is Jahaira. Um, I'm also a Harvard alumni and I've worked uh, developing AI technology from the technical side and also product management side. Um, and I, I really appreciated the different like types of risks or hierarchy of risks that were mentioned. I'm curious, how do you see, you know, both of you, uh, the line between a model that wasn't being built to diligent, doing the proper due diligence versus a model that is being used by a bad actor? I um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, well, I, I'm not quite sure. I, I, I'm trying to picture a scenario, but. I, I, it would definitely be the developer will be accountable should be accountable um, you, whether if they designed it badly or didn't really think through all the implications I would is that is a question of about accountability or 
Well, I, I guess it's, um, so we mentioned, you know, it could be that the model wasn't built, uh, the model built as intended. And then yes. if the model, the model was built as intended, but it's been used by a bad actor. Ah. But, so when then, where is the line between a model that is being used by a bad actor versus a model that didn't go through the proper due diligence? Didn't get, okay, so that a bad okay. Actor didn't do what they're trying to do. It's, it's a good question. I, I, yeah, in our world, we're both the uh, developer and the deployer, so I, we're accountable for both. Um, I, I don't have a clear I, I don't have a clear line in my head because I, I haven't really thought about that question much. Do you? Yeah, I mean, any technology, any uh, AI is a tool. It can be misused. Um, so, uh, and and ultimately, the creators of AI can't bear all the responsibility for misuse, or you would never put anything on the market. Like it just, and the same is true with any tool. Um, it's just that AI has risk; it could scale more than you know. But you think about it with gun manufacturers, there's debate about that, right? I mean, but it's the same kind of thing. You're misusing it. Um, so I think we have responsibilities as creators, um, developers, deployers to build as many safeguards in place as possible to prevent misuse. But ultimately, that's something and that's part of the reason why this whole open approach, the more people you have who are testing, who are red teaming, who are trying to challenge how could this model potentially be misused before you deploy it is one way of addressing it. And I do think that's a creator's responsibility. But again, in your own mind, you got to balance like, are we ever going to not deploy something because anything could be misused? This chair, somebody could pick it up and, you know, throw it at somebody. <laughs> I mean, that's just the bottom line. But exercises like red teaming are focused on that right now. You should be able to, to have, before you put out a major model, have a bunch of people not from your creator team, see what harm they could do with it. Yeah, and then Christina, maybe inspired by one of the questions from Jonathan here online, is uh, one could think about this topic also from a precision regulation perspective, since uh, you're, uh, you, you've talked about you know, not necessarily being in favor for licensing, but uh, how do you see this from an industry perspective? And this could get closer to already existing regulation that it, exists within industry, the context of industries, right? And then uh, potentially hold people accountable to the standards that are already existing within that industry. Yeah, no, that's exactly right, which is why we've been saying, you know, we don't need a single federal reg re uh, regulator, for example, like every regulator understands how the risks of AI deployed within their uh, the context of their own regulatory authority is going to play out. And it plays out very differently in um, the banking context than it does in the transportation sector, than it does in you know consumer fairness and the FTC is very focused on that. Um, so I do think having a risk-based approach, providing more and imposing from a regulatory perspective, more restrictive requirements on creators of models that are used in sectors and users and deployers of models that are used in high risk sectors where more harm can be generated is where this, you know, where this uh, goes next. I think we have one here that has been patiently waiting for quite a while. This I'm, is here in the, in the, yep. I, I'm an alum of the Graduate School of Education's Risk and Prevention Program, and I run a mission-driven innovation strategy consultancy. Um, since you work, I believe you said, in 175 countries, and you're dedicated, IBM is dedicated, for instance, to education. I'm wondering, and you have this academy, but I'm wondering if you have initiatives that are sort of pushing out, if you will, into the education systems, K through 12, um, to help train the next generations uh, to be thinking about this, and also as creators and innovators, um, but also country contexts are different. so. Uh, Chile might be thinking differently about its AI strategy versus Mexico versus uh, Brazil, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wondering if you can speak to, to that. Yeah, I mean, not to the details of it, but we do have um, a corporate citizenship program that has very much been focused on deploying skills build, it's, it, you know, uh, to K through 12, to graduate schools. And there's unique programs tailored to different parts of the world as well. So um, 
that's something our head of corporate citizenship can speak to the details on, but it's definitely a focus. And one of the things you'll see with AI is this ability for more personalized learning as well, right? I mean, I think the more AI has the potential to customize learning in ways that we never could do before to individualize it, to make it specific to geographies. But, you know, this is some of the broader societal issues that we were talking about before. Um, so it's important. Paula, we have two more questions in the room. If they are brief, uh, we can do one after the other and then panelists can respond to them. And then maybe you can run one more online. What do you think? Very good. So let's have two brief questions and brief answers. Then we wrap up. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I'm Satoshi Narihara. I'm from Japan. And now I'm visiting Scala at Harvard Yankee Institute. Uh, I'd like to ask a, a question for Christina. Um, as you pointed out, uh, cont social context of use of AI is important. Therefore, uh, as you suggest, it may be a, we should regulate uh, not technology itself, but its use. Uh, on the other hand, and some experts point out uh, technology is never neutral. Uh, so technology uh, 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 embrace, uh, improve, uh, or hinder uh, some barriers. Um, uh, for example, some technologies are uh, privacy friendly, other technologies are invasive. Uh, if that is true, uh, uh, I, I wonder if uh, we may regulate uh, technology itself under some circumstances. What do you think about this point? Thank you. Maybe we take the second question and uh, just for efficiency. Hi, thank you for coming for this panel. Um, NIST RMFs, uh, NIST Risk Management Framework has come up a couple times, and I'm wondering if that means that industry is encouraging of compliance and auditing. Well, we're encouraging, I mean, I can't speak for all of industry. I could speak for IBM's position that we are very supportive of the NIST risk management framework. We've mapped our own governance program to it. Um, and AI auditing is something that needs further study. Like, I definitely think there are scenarios where in high risk contexts, auditing could be a solution to help build trust but we're not anywhere near the point where we even know what that would look like um, and have a standardization around an AI auditing profession for third party audits. So I think we can't let the regulation get ahead of um, the regulation and the requirements get ahead of the capabilities to do that in the first place and then being thoughtful about where we're requiring it. And on the point of regulating the technology, um, I, do, I'm, I, I will admit I'm sort of struggling, like I understand there may be scenarios where the technology, we may say the technology shouldn't be used in this context, um, but I still believe that a use space lens rather than regulating the technology, because how would you do that? Like I, now there's a lot of focus on frontier models and imposing certain regulations on the highest, most capable models but that threshold like I, I still struggle and this is my personal point of view with the definition of frontier like somebody just made it up and decided that somehow models with you know a certain um flops you know size uh, and compute capacity are more dangerous than models below that capacity and i'm not sure that anybody knows why they chose that threshold other than the fact that no one has it out on the market today at that threshold, you know? So uh, I'm not a fan of regulating technology for technology's sake. I can have one comment. Just just to, to put a point on that, the one of the first things that Meta, uh, not the first thing, but a few years ago, we stepped back, we're realizing we had all these engineers building different models. It, it, there was a, a long exercise internally to define what is a model and and begin to inventory them and and many many things are not models that we thought were models and and sort of boil defining that and beginning to manage them systematically is is harder than it sounds in these uh, development environments so um, yeah I'm assuming, I'm assuming and by the way the models today we use LLMs or we use Gen AI type stuff. Tomorrow it's going to be something different, uh, and they're they're already working on the next iteration that's totally different, and it's going to have a whole different set of issues. So just to reiterate, like regulating one type of model or one specific technology is sort of sort of fruitless. 
Thank you, John. Thank you, Christina. And uh, I wanted to go back to uh, a comment that I made in the beginning, which is this widening gap between this leading edge of technology innovation and our ability as a society to drive standards and, and regulate. If you go down the river here to MIT and talk to people like uh, Gabriella Ross, uh, she'll talk about uh, liquid neural networks that they may have uh, 100 to 1,000 times uh, more capability than the current LLMs. Uh, if you were to talk about, uh, or with uh, Ian LeCun, uh, maybe more in his capacity as uh, a professor at NYU than uh, as the chief AI scientist at Meta, he would say that LLMs are a thing of the past and that really we should be looking at uh, uh, at uh, you know object-driven AI, so this just may go to show uh, the futility of trying to regulate technology. Think about uh, uh, if any perfect regulation had been passed as of maybe September of last year, before ChatGPT, and that would be completely you know obsolete, right? So uh, while I'm not uh, trying to suggest that we should abrogate our you know, desire and our hard work to make sure that we identify how to regulate some of this. I think there's, there are different approaches. Uh, maybe it's risk-based, maybe it's industry-based, maybe it's use-based uh, that may, may have to be complementary to just trying to put shackles on the technology itself. But I wanted to uh, thank you all for uh, coming today. Uh, thank our panelists and uh, the Berkman Klein Center for hosting and uh, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.